The word you hear, the word of God you hear is what determines the faith you walk in. I repeat it. The word of God you hear is what determines the faith you walk in. And so preaching is not an item on church calendar or church event. Preaching is the means to nourish the human spirit. Preaching is the means to bring in faith to the hearers. Preaching is the means to let the, God, the power of God invade people's life. Preaching is the means to saturate an environment, an atmosphere, a, a situation with God's word and the power of his word. He said God manifested his word through preaching. So preaching is the means to see God at work, to allow, permit God to work in a a life or in a situation. So preaching is not just an item. That is why every genuine and decent godly preaching must be based heavily, strongly on the word of God. On the word of God, because no man has anything to say which can help man apart from the word of God. So it must be hinged on the word of God. Preaching of the word of God is what brings deliverance and relief. Who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? Matchless love and beauty and this word. Nothing in this world can satisfy Cause Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry Treasure of my heart and of my soul In my weakness you are merciful Redeemer of my past and present wrongs, holder of my future days to come. In your presence, your presence is heaven to me. To me. Oh Lord, in your presence, Lord. Your Let us hold fast our profession. It's a profession of faith. Hold fast. You know, you see the hold fast has appeared here again. Hold tight. Hold fast. Why? Because you, you can tell we have a high priest there. And so you have to hold fast. Don't compromise on your belief in Christ. Don't let the situation change your position in God. Do this church thing. Do it well. Bro, sis, do it well. Do it well. Do this church thing well, with sincerity, with fidelity, with humility, and with purity. Do it well, holding fast the profession of your faith. Our high priest works with the profession of our faith. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank God for another day, a beautiful day. We thank God for Sunday. Thank God it's Sunday, the beginning of the week. Sunday, the eighth day, is a reflection of the new beginning. It's the reflection of the resurrection. And it's a reflection of the when God created again. All right, God rested on the seventh day and on the eighth day. Bible says that that's on the day of resurrection. When Jesus resurrected, God created the one new man, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. 15, the one new man, that is the church. You are, for you are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus. So God created, after he finished the first creation, he rested the seventh day and the eighth day, he started creating again, went back to creation. And guess what he created? He created the church, Ephesians 2, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For ye, the church, are the workmanship of God, the masterpiece of God, the the display of God's central central design, the whole world and the whole creation. The church is the center because we are the masterpiece, masterpiece of God's work. Hallelujah! But he created, after he has created everything, rested, and then he created again. For ye, we are the workmanship of God. So thank God for Sunday. That's what I'm trying to say. Thank God for Sunday. Sunday theological circles is a reflection or spiritual circles, spiritual terms is a reflection of when God went back to create, start create creation again, creating. If any man is in Christ, First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creation, a new creation. So God started creating again. Hallelujah. And I thank God for your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege to hear your word. We pray that you reveal yourself to us, reveal Christ to us. Holy Spirit, enlighten the eyes of our understanding that we will behold Christ in the pages of scripture. Anoint me and let my speaking be your speaking. Give me boldness and utterance that I might declare with boldness the mysteries of your kingdom to the glory of your name, that Christ will not be eclipsed, that Christ will not be obscured, that Christ will not be moved out of focus, but Christ will come back into the focus of people's work with you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Heal the sick, deliver the captives, save the lost, break addictions, power of addictions, be broken through the delivery of your word. Thank you, Jesus, that your power is here to glorify your name. For your word said that they went preaching and God confirmed their word with signs, wonders, and miracles following. God confirm the word of your grace to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Jesus, the God man. Jesus, the God man. In our previous teaching, please don't forget to like this channel. <laughs> don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to share it. In our previous teaching, I spoke about how Jesus Christ is fully man, all right? So uh, in, in, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says that great and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen, in, seen of angels, preached unto the, on, unto the Gentiles, believed on in uh, in the world and received into glory. So without controversy, it's, it's, there's no two ways about that. It doesn't require any dispute. Great is the mystery of godliness. The mystery of God, godliness, Bible says, is great. All right. So without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. In other words, the concealedness, something has been concealed. You can't just look at the church or look at Christianity and just understand it at a go. It doesn't matter how it gets explained to you. The Bible says that these things are spiritually designed. So great is the mystery of godliness. Now watch this. And the core of the mystery is not spooky things we do or spooky things or unexplainable things that happen. No, not even miracles. The core, the core of the mystery of godliness is God was manifested in the flesh. Yes, God manifested in the flesh. That is the core. And I spoke about he manifested in the flesh in that previous teaching. He was fully man. See, sometimes people erroneously, wrong, wrongly, might think Jesus is he like a mermaid, all right? 
uh, or, 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 or the, in the fairy tales, is it? Yeah, mermaid. Sorry, mermaid in the, in the fairy tale. <laughs> you know, we have the we, uh, partly human and partly fish. Okay, so it's like half human, half fish. So it's a mermaid. Is a mermaid? Yeah, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. So, so, so at least thank God I can get my scriptures. Okay. So, um, some things are part, part. So it's like 100, 50%. You can't say somebody is 50% fish and 50% human being. It's 100% human being. Because to be 100% human being, you must have all the legs. But this one doesn't have legs. All right. He had, he has things. Uh, 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 part of it is fish. All right. So people think that Jesus is 50% man and 50% God. Please, please, no, no, no. Christ, Jesus Christ is not 50% man or 50% God. Please, no, no. Pastor, so what is he? He is 100% man. That's why I said he's not Superman. He is Savior man. He's real man, not exceptional in, in, the, in his humanity. He was just like us at every point. He was tempted like us. He was very much like us. Since the children, or since the children were flesh and blood, Hebrews 2.14, he himself shared in the same. So he had to be the same as us. Yes. So he is 100% man. In the previous teaching, I, I went on much about that. And But not just that. He, he is also, the good news is, he is 100% God. Not 100% man and, and not 50% man and 50% God. No, no, no. He is 100% man and guess what? 100% God. What's the meaning of that? That means that he is truly man, fully man and fully God. Or the theological term is truly God. So truly man and truly God, very God, the very God, he's very God, very man. No wonder the Pontius Pilate said uh, in, in, uh, in, in, sorry, John chapter 19, 5, he said, behold the man, eka homo, eka homo, behold the man, he is actual man. The Acts chapter 2, 22, the man, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, a man, he, he, he was a man and still, good news, still is a man. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, even the man. That's First Timothy 1, 2, sorry, 2, 5. Even the man, Jesus. All right. So he's, now, so I spoke about his fully man in a previous teaching. I think it would be good to just touch a bit on. There's so much we can go into, but permit me to just try and touch the surface just for the purposes of teaching and explanation on this, uh, at this time. Um, so we want to talk about his God man, his fully God. All right, he's fully God. What makes you say Jesus is God, is fully God? I remember there was a time we went to Birmingham and we were, we were preaching on the streets. And in Birmingham, for some reason, is saturated with a lot of Muslims. And um, they have dominated the city center. So when we showed up with fire, at the fire, it took people by surprise because Christians couldn't be that bold and declare the faith. So some were trying to come and, you know, those who were extremists were trying to create tension and create problem. But, you know, Christians, we don't have time for that. And um, but some too, you know, who are, who are good and moderate will engage you and believe that you are wrong and blah, blah, blah. So there's a guy who came to me, even later I found out that he was an imam. He came to me, try and engage me. You know, they are not interested in the message. They are just, they want to prove that you are wrong. And guess what? He told me that Jesus is not God. <laughs> That's the problem. How can you say all religions are the same? We are not, we, we look the same on the surface, but we are fundamentally different. People think really all religions look different on the surface, but fundamentally the same. No, 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 it's rather the other way around. We look, uh, we look uh, uh, the same on the surface, but we are fundamentally different. The problem with Christianity, what makes Christianity exclusive? Christianity is so exclusive. What makes it exclusive is the message, the message about Christ, who Christ is. You can't say you're a Christian when you, when you say, when you don't believe he's God. Uh-oh, 
then you are believing. <laughs> you are believed in a wrong Jesus. I'll say it again. If you don't believe Jesus is God and you think you are a Christian, I think you don't know him and you have believed it. No, I think, I know, you don't know him. The scriptures say you don't know him and you have believed in the wrong Jesus. He said, if you believe um, in John 8, 24, he said, you will die in your sin except you believe that I am. The he, the, well, there was the translators, but in the original Greek, it is no he. So you can just for the explanation. He said, unless you believe I am he, I am. I am is the name of God. He said, unless you believe, I am. <laughs> you know, in verse 28, actually, sorry, John chapter 8, verse 24, he said, unless you believe, I am, I am, you will die in your sins. In the verse 28, he said the same thing. Unless you believe, I am. In the verse 58, he said, before Abraham, I am. In fact, the, the English, the way that it was rendered in the English doesn't do justice. Actually, it's ego, the Greek is ego imi, ego imi. And usually when you say ego, it means I am. All right, and you say imi is also another way of saying I am in a different sense. But Jesus says, ego imi, I am, I am. I am, I am, or to make it easier, I, I am. So we, is, <laughs> he said before Abraham, John chapter 8, verse 58, before Abraham, Jesus said before Abraham, I, I am. <laughs> when he say I, I am, that's the name of God. Exodus chapter three, verse 14. I'll come to that in a minute. So, he, 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 but this guy said, Jesus is not God. There's no way he said he's God. And I, I said, no, Jesus is God. He said, he, he admitted he's God. He said, there's no way in the Bible. I said, see what? Then he pulls out a Bible to my surprise from his back pocket. <laughs> hey, most, what's the Muslim do with the Bible? I thought you should pull out Quran. I would not have time keeping Quran around me, unless for, uh, if I am called to help Christians understand. But that's not my calling anyway. I have not finished reading the Bible. There's too much in the Bible to discover than to spend my time reading other books. It's not necessary. Oh, those who say, oh, yes, you have to be broad-minded. All right, I don't want to go into that. So it's, there's nothing broad-mindedness in that. It's actually shallow-mindedness, okay? Because you, you haven't exhausted one, and you can't exhaust one. And that's why you, you touch the scriptures on the surface. Do you see it as a manual of manual for research? You are trying to say God cannot be researched. God is revealed. You can research to find God. He reveals himself. Okay. So I'm going to research. Okay. I'm checking all the books. No, you can research to find God. He reveals himself. Think about that. How can I manage to find it? Uh, I, I said, I'm going to do a research to find the queen's, the queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth's number, phone number. <laughs> I'm going to find it. No, she must give it to me or it must be given to me. I can't go do researching and find it. Some things are beyond the limits of research. Okay. So now, so he said that, Jesus Christ, he pulls, uh, uh, started opening. I know, you will say, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. But let's look at it. Jesus, I said, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. But you know what? Even in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, God said, you are God. God, <laughs> God, God calls Jesus God. <laughs> God himself, the Father, he calls Jesus God. Is there. All right, let me show you something. He says that, but unto, unto the Son, he said, God said, Thy throne, O God, <laughs> thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the, and the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thy throne, O God, is the throne. Let me read the New King James from that version, because the, uh, the, the New King James tends to normally put italize the names of God and the pronouns relating to God. So look at New King James chapter 1 verse um, 8. Hebrews 1 8 it says that, but to the son he, see the he there, God said to the son God said, your throne O God, your, you God, you son, your throne is an ever your throne O God is uh, is, um, um, is forever and ever. Alright so God himself calls him God. He calls the son God. <laughs> David calls him my Lord. <laughs> so he says that the Messiah, whose son is he? And, and that's what he says, the, the, the scriptures say in John. I've been referring to this quite a bit. In John chapter 
20 verse 30 and 31, he says that there's so many things he says they there were not recorded, but this has been recorded that you might believe and in believing, uh, you must believe, sorry, not just believe, but believe that he is the son of God. That's so important. So our believing, the saving belief, the belief that saves us is the belief, believing that he is the son of God. Didn't he say that if you believe, unless you believe I am he, you will die in your sins. So you are not saved if you believe anyway. It, uh, you believe any other way or any other thing or you believe otherwise. That's actually what I want. If you believe otherwise, you are not saved. You are. You might be going to church. I'm saying some serious things, brothers and sisters. I'm saying some th- serious things that has been eclipsed from many Christians or many, many professing Christians. Let me use that. Many professing Christians. They have... Pro, the, the, there's the profession of faith, but they don't have possession of faith. Profession of saving faith without the possession of saving faith. And the saving faith comes as a result of believing, believing that he is the son of God. In other words, he is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. No religion. Can I agree with this? No religion. But that's the core of Christian religion. Right. Oh, the, let me call it a religion. Christianity. The core of Christianity is Jesus. And what about Jesus? That he's, he is God. And guess what? He is man. He's the son of God and he's the son of man. He is the very God of very God and he's, a, he's the very man. He's truly God and truly man. Truly God and truly man. Is that not a mystery? Pastor, how can somebody be fully man and at the same time fully somebody else? Or oh, for instance, how can you be fully woman, a female, and fully male. It can be. You are either fully male or fully female. You can be fully male and fully female. It it can happen. You can be fully dog and fully cat. (laughs) Two natures. You can be fully tree, tree. Even just in the the realm of... uh, 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 agronomy or uh, uh, b- b- uh, botany. You 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 cannot be an apple tree and at the same time at the same time an orange tree. Jesus. So that's the mystery. Jesus is fully God and fully man, and it's, it remains a mystery. So he said, "Oh no no no, without controversy." Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. So what we saw in the flesh was actually God walking in the flesh. God walking. That's what he said. He, 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 he came to be God. Now, there are a few things that point to his deity, that point to the fact that he's God. One, number one is his birth. Number two, his living, his human living. Number three, um, his death. Number four, his resurrection. I just restrain myself to this. So his birth. What about his birth? Everything about his birth shows that he's not uh, his deity. His deity. He's, or, he's not just ordinary. Even though he's fully man, he's not just the norm, the ordinary man. Pastor, but you, you said in your teaching that he's, 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 he's just like us. Yeah, he's just like us in every way. And he's also what we are not. Okay? So he's... Everything we are apart from sin. When you talk about definition of a human being, he is all that. So there's nothing human he is not. However, there is, there is something supernatural about him we are not and cannot be. So what is that supernatural? He's God. He's deity. He, has, he, he, he is God manifested and the word was God. And the word was God, John 1, 2, and the, sorry, John 1, 1, and the word was God, verse 14, and the word became flesh, uh, uh, manifested physically. So he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the father. Huh. So his birth, how, how, how about his birth? Oh, his virgin birth. No virgin has ever given birth. No virgin. As I taught the other time, as I was teaching on, um, I think the, I think one of the Christmas was also I was teaching on the birth of Jesus, and I spoke about um, uh, parthenog- parthenogenesis. Okay, parthenogenesis is a, it's an a rare and a st- extreme, extremely, 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 extremely rare phenomenon in human species or other certain other species who can give birth without fertilization so the egg multiplies by itself so there's an extreme scientific phenomenon called 
parthenogenesis, where the woman's egg, without fertilization, without a seed from the man, begins to multiply and form another human being. And in all those cases, or even rare, all those cases, you only have female, because the female does not have the male chromosome in, inherent in her. So it's only you only have female. But Jesus Christ said, a virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son. A woman cannot just give birth to a son by herself. And so he had a virgin birth. That makes him supernatural. All right. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, he said, For a virgin, as Isaiah said, it's in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Yes, I think so. And then Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, said, A virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay. So it's a virgin. He's the virgin's son. All right. He's the That's serious. He is the virgin son. That cannot be natural. He is the virgin son. And how about and the, the angel? When the angel told Mary you're about to have a child, Mary actually admitted that. How can these things be? Since I know no man. Luke chapter one verse 20, 34. How can such a thing happen? I don't know a man. A man has not visited me. A man has not known me intimately. How can I conceive? And the angel said, "Don't worry. The pa'o kadabashita madi in." In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, it says that the power of the highest shall overshadow you. The spirit of the Lord shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore, that holy child will be born, will be called the holy child of God. All right, that holy thing. So, Jesus Christ, his birth was unique. Look at when he was born. Star, the star, the position of his birth was determining where the star was. So, uh, uh, astrologers Astrologers say, ah, that, that is a, a good case for astro, uh, astrology. No, no, no. In astrology, they say that the, when a child is born, the position of a, a star will determine the destiny of a child, the person who has been born. But in Christ's situation, it's different. The position of the child was determining the positioning, the movement of the, the star. Where he was was determine where the star will be. Hallelujah. He changed the galaxies. Angels came to sing. Angels Angels, whilst shepherd were their flock by night. Angel, that was an, an, an unusual birth. There was a supernatural birth. Hallelujah. So he had a super, I don't want to spend too much time on that. He had a supernatural birth. How about his living? I'll, I'll speak a bit more about the living, but let me mention the death, how he died, the way he died and he's resurrected. Okay, let me just go into the live, his living. His normal living, I'll, I'll categorize it into three ways. Oh, two major aspects of his living. First of all, before his baptism, and so pre-baptism and post-baptism. Pre-baptism, he was 30 years old. But um, when he was 12 years, a child is considered a child are in that in their tradition until you are 12. When you are 12, you become a man, and then you pra- start practicing your father's business. Okay? You start practicing your father's business. You remember Luke chapter 2, verse 38. I don't even know I have to be about my father's business now that I'm 12. So you have to practice your father's business. But he knew, even though no one had told him, he knew that Joseph was not his father. All right? Joseph. So Mary said, your father, in Luke chapter 2, verse 37, oh, sorry, 47, Mary said, your father and I have been looking for you. And he said, no, I have to be about my father's business. Because now that he's 12, he has to start the, the, the trade of his father. But because of his, his, he was a fully man, he was sent home. He went home with them, Bible said, and he was subject to them. For 18 years, he was subject to them and he worked at as a carpenter. Okay, so he was a wood worker. But after 18 years, when, after those 18 years, the last three years of his life, he was not a woodworker. He was a wonder worker. Hallelujah. The woodworker becomes a wonder worker. Hallelujah. How did that happen? Now, when, and, and so, at the, much of his achievement was accomplished around his age of 33. Sorry, uh, just between that story, that from 30 to 33, the last three years of his life, much of the great things that were done after the Holy Spirit came upon him. Now, watch this. So what is it unique about the things he did that makes him God? Number one, I want you to remember three things. The things he did, what he said, okay, sorry, uh, sorry, what he did, who he was, and what he said. These three things are essential. So what he did, let's look at what um, the things he did. 
He did so many miracles. Some of the miracles were astounding. But you know, the miracles alone were not enough. He did miracles on people, and miracles with people, and miracles with things. So the miracles alone he did were, were not enough to point that he was God. Because there were others who were also doing the miracles. You remember, I think, um, that when they were, he was accused of using Beelzebub demons. He said, if I'm using Beelzebub your sons, by what spirit did they also used to do those miracles? So he wasn't the only miracle worker. There were other people who worked miracles. Actually, Elijah, Eli, Elijah, Elisha, Moses, them, they also performed miracles. So you, we can't just use only the miracles of Jesus to define or de- de- to determine his deity. I hope I'm, I'm getting, you're getting what I'm saying. But however, he did certain exceptional miracles which all the other miracle workers couldn't do. All right, he did such exceptional. Raising the dead was not too exceptional because uh, Elisha raised the dead and Elijah also raised the dead. All right, even though it was very unique. His death, raising the dead, he raised Lazarus, brought Lazarus back to life. And Lazarus has already entered uh, petrification. He was decomposing. Four days dead body has already started decomposing. Okay, so he was decomposing, but Jesus brought a decomposed body, a body that has started decomposing, brought it back to life. That is that's very powerful. That is unusual. All right. However, that alone doesn't point to his deity. And um, the opening of the blind. You remember in John chapter nine, the man whose eye was who was born blind, whose eyes were open. He said, "Have you ever seen? Have you had ever had the blind open the eye before?" Have you ever any man born blind whose eyes have opened? He said this man, this man is 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 uh, is a special man. In fact, because the Pharisees told him, "Don't follow this man. He's a sinner." He said, "Whether he's a sinner or not, me, I don't know. Until I know, I was blind, but now I see." Have you ever heard of any man, uh, any any man who opened the eye of the blind? That's what he said. Because it wasn't part of the Old Testament miracles or regular miracles of the day to open the eye of a person born blind. But Jesus did it. That, that's why when John the Baptist sent in, I think, John chapter 11, sorry, Matthew chapter 11, he sent to, for his disciples to go and ask Jesus, are you the one to come or we should expect another? Whilst he was in prison, Jesus said, he referred to Isaiah, go and tell him. So he quoted from Isaiah, the blind see. Spoke about one of the things that showed that the Messiah came. He said, "The blind see." He said, "For the, the spirit of John." And then he, Jesus Himself, when He started His ministry in in His hometown, in Luke chapter, Luke chapter four, verse. 18 and 19, the Spirit of God is upon me for has anointed me to preach the gospel and is added to open the sight, give sight to the blind. Hallelujah. So he did this. So these are miracles he did on people, several miracles he did on people. But not only the miracles he did on people, he also performed miracles on things. For instance, he turned water into wine. John chapter 2, can you imagine? He turned water into wine. This is always doing on people. He was doing on things. And not just that. The One of the most beautiful, remarkable one is that he walked on the water. In Matthew chapter 14, from verse 26 down, was, of, yeah, from 24, 25, 26 down, was, he was walking on the water. Jesus walked on the water. That's super. He suspended the, the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the laws, scientific laws that would make him sink. All right. And he was floating on water. Or he... He worked against the law of flotation. For you to float, there might be some things in place. But he actually was not floating. He walked on water. How about in Mark chapter 4, from verse 39, that was, Bible says he rebuked the storm and said, Peace be still. Come on, shut up. Stop that. And they were all amazed and said, what? <laughs> Mark chapter 4, verse 41, 42, somewhere there. He said, what manner of man is this? That even the storms of him, I command the power by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, that satanic storms in your life, I command the storm to cease. I command the storm to cease. I command the storm to cease. I command peace be still. Peace be still in the mighty name of Jesus. He commanded the storms and the storms obeyed him. That's remarkable. He, he operated with the grace of God in an, unusual, in an unusual manner. So the things he did and who he was, he was unique. But I want you to know that they didn't kill him because of the things he did. All right? Because did, Jesus said, you, um, you are he said, for what, which of the good things have I done that you accuse? He said, for the good things you have done, we are not accusing you for that. In the book of John, he said, we don't accuse you for the good things you have done, for, for, but for making yourself equal with God. That was the problem, and I'm going to go into that in a minute. So he wasn't, 
He wasn't killed because of the, th- the good things he did. And the good things, G- G- Peter said that how God anointed Jesus from Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, verse 7, 38, who went about doing good. He was doing good. There was no negative side effect of the things Jesus did for which reason no one would kill, uh, they would want to kill him. No one killed him for that. No one attacked him because of the good works. He wasn't killed because of his good work. So now his, his miracles were unique and not only the miracles were unique. Number two, he himself, he was a very unique person. I mean, can you imagine he, he was a perfect man. He was perfect, infallible. He didn't do anything wrong. The, the Pontius Pilate said in Matthew, John chapter 19, I think verse 4 and verse 6, he said, I find no fault in him. I, I've examined I'm the highest. He was the highest court in the then time. The highest court. And they, they, he examined him. He said, I find no fault in him. The thief on the cross in Luke chapter, chapter 23, he said that, listen, this man has not done anything wrong. <laughs> Even the thieves know that this man is, has not done anything wrong. We deserve to go through. Luke chapter 23, I think verse 44, 45, 46, somewhere there. Yeah, something like that. He said, I, we deserve to go through what we are going to. But this man is innocent. He hasn't done anything wrong. The thieves knew. In fact, those who brought accusation against him, they didn't have any reason to accuse him for what he has done. So all they could say is that he said that he would destroy the temple. And Rave uh, built it in three days. He said he would destroy. But he didn't actually say he would destroy the temple. He said, destroy the temple and in three days I will raise it. And Bible said he spoke concerning his body. Hallelujah. And so, um, when uh, he was, Jesus was impeccable and infallible. People, there's, there's the normal English adage that says that no man is perfect. That's, uh, that's partially true. It's not fully true because Jesus was perfect as a man. Jesus was perfect. He's the only one who was perfect. That's why he's, he, he could save us by his blood. Because he was perfect. Perfect blood. Sinless blood. He was fallen. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible, I think 18, yeah, said for verse 17 talks about how we have not been redeemed by corruptible things, by silver, like silver and gold, but with the us with the ble- with the precious blood of the lamb without blemish, without spot. Exodus chapter 12 from verse 4. He said you have to examine the lamb for four days and make sure it doesn't have spot or blemish. Jesus Christ was the lamb of God who was, hallelujah, slain for us. Praise God. So he was faultless. He was without sin. In Hebrews chapter Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says that, for we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but we, for he, he was tempted at all points like us, but yet without sin. In Romans, sorry, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he made him, God made him who knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin. He was sinless to the extent that he, uh, he asked his enemies, his highest critics, he asked them, which of you, John chapter 8, verse 46, which of you accuse me of sin? Which of you here can accuse me of sin? But he could tell the people, John chapter 8, he could tell the people, if any of you who is not without sin, let him cast the first stone. You, as man, you are with sin, but me without sin. In Romans chapter 8, verse 3, for what the law could not do in that he was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his, his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and yet, and without sin, okay, and condemn sin in the flesh because he could live and condemn sin in the flesh. Hallelujah. So Jesus Christ, he, who he was, he was sinless. Peter said, oh, depart from me. I'm an evil man. I'm a sinful man. Depart from me. Depart from me, Lord. Depart from me. What did they see about the man? And they knew that there was something unusual and usually super, unusually supernatural about him. Depart from me. Depart from me. I'm a simple, I'm, I'm a sinful man. Can you imagine? He could look at a, a man and tell the man that your sins are forgiven. I'll come to that in a minute. But Jesus was the only man who could, because in Mark chapter Chapter 2, verse 7. He said, the Pharisees, they said, who can forgive sin but God? It's only God who can forgive sins. So for him to forgive sins is a sign that he was. Praise God. So the, who he was, he was very unique. He was the unique son of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible says that the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When he was being by the Mount of Transfiguration, 
is in Matthew chapter 17 from verse 1, but particularly from 3, from 3, for the Bible says, the voice came and said, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him, listen to him. And on his baptism, at his baptism, in Luke chapter 3, the Bible says that the heavens were open, the Spirit of God descended, and a voice came, he said, this is my beloved son. Hallelujah. So, so he, God even lent the, lent him, the, gave him the, credibility or God lent assent to the fact that he is my son. He is God. He is God. He So the, those are some of the things that he, so what he did and who he was. But I also want to talk about the, the third aspect of his living. So what he is, who he was, but the third aspect of his living. And that is what brought him his death. That made him them kill him. What he said. And what he said are in two, two ways. The things he said about morals and to people. So he was teaching higher standard of morality. Jesus taught the higher standard of morality. He said you don't have to commit fornication. Fornication is even too far. Just to look at the woman and desire it, you are gone. <laughs> to think about it, you have done. That is the highest standard of morality. Modern day, modern day, uh, Backsliding Christians, they want to oh, just let's 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 lower the standard so that people can identify with it. No, Jesus didn't come to lower the standard. He came to raise the standard. And he brought the standard of God and to raise us to that level. So when you come, real Christianity doesn't lower the standards of God, but what it raises you to the standard of God. Hallelujah! It empowers you to live at the standard of God. That is why in Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-two, he said, "But the fruit of the spirit is love." His joy, and after mentioning, he said, "Against such there is no law. Against such, in verse twenty-three, against such or twenty-four somewhere there. Against such there is no law. There's no law if these things are beginning to manifest in your life." He brought, he, excuse me, he comes to bring us to a certain standard. So the the things he spoke about, his teachings, the things he told people to do, he said, when someone slaps, you slap on the, all these things are very high moral standards. That was not what gained him the problem. What brought him the problem were the things he said about himself. In, in I think I was reading earlier on in John chapter 8, verse 55, he said that if I say I do not know God, I'll be a liar like you guys. I can't deny who, who I am and what I know. I know the Father. And if I say I do not know him, you don't know him. But if I say I don't know him, I'll be a liar like you. <laughs> because why are they liars? Because they claim God is their father. They claim they know God, but they didn't know God. You are saying it's your father. You didn't know him. And he told them that um, the, he is from God. And these words I'm telling you, anyone who believes in these words I'm saying will live and never see death. And they say, excuse me, are you making yourself bigger than Abraham? Abraham, our father, even saw death. Death. He, he, de he died. And the prophets died in John chapter um, 8 from verse 48 there. Eh? Are you making yourself equal, uh, greater than Abraham? He actually was. And then you know what, how in his response, what he told them? He said, actually, Abraham desired to see my days and saw it and was glad. And they'll look at you. Ah, we said, yeah, we know. We said you, are, you have a demon. You have a devil. You are not even yet 50. And you said, uh, Abraham saw your days. He said, verse 58, before Abraham, he didn't say I was. He said, ego imi, before Abraham, I, I am. I am God. I'm greater than Abraham. I am. I'm going to go to that a minute again. I keep coming back to go. I love it so much. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. So the things he said concerning himself, that was what they, they had. That's what they had the problem with. Let's quickly look at some of the things he said concerning himself. Number one, that's what I was talking about. Genesis, um, because in Exodus chapter three, verse 14, when Moses asked God, when I go, what should I say? Who should I say sent me? What is your name? God said, I am that I am. Say, I am that I am. I am? I am is the name of God. Jewish Jews don't mention it. So they, they even say, uh, 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 heaven, the water we use. That's why Matthew, most of the time, you don't see um, the phrase, the kingdom of God in the book of Matthew because Matthew was a Jew and Jews are careful. They won't use God. So it says the kingdom of heaven because the name of God, the abounds Jews, is an ineffable, the, his ineffable name. All right, his He's a holy, you don't pronounce the name. So Jews will never pronounce. That's why they just spell it Y-H-W-H, -H, which the, in the English, some German theologian translated it Jehovah. 
all right, Jehovah, but because Y, Y, J, okay, it's not J, it's Y, that's why some people say Yahweh, just put A and Yahweh, okay, but it's Y, H, W, H in the Hebrew, which, which they don't pronounce it, but it sounds like Yahweh, Yahweh, okay, and that means, what's the meaning of Yahweh? I am, Jesus said before Abraham, me, I am, hallelujah, and you know what happened? He said, excuse me, how can you say that? They, then they pick up stones to stone him. Luke chapter 8, sorry, John chapter 8, the end bit. They took up, let me read it. It is always good for a pastor and a preacher to read from the Bible. Okay, it is good. It's just a healthy spiritual practice. Even if it's one verse, read it, let the Bible speak. Verse 59, verse 58, he said unto them, Verily, 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 I say unto you, before Abraham, I am. Then took they up stones to cast him, uh, to cast at him. But Jesus, him, Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. He just, there were, in his lifetime, there were five attempts to kill him. Five attempts to kill him, and none of them were successful. Five at ten. The first one was when he preached his first message in his own hometown, Nazareth, in Luke chapter 4. When he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has, oh, gee, don't think that everybody will like you when you preach the true gospel. The other time my daughter asked me, oh, I can't believe somebody put a like or dislike on you. I said, that's a good sign. Don't worry. That's a good sign. Jesus said, woe betide you if all men speak well of you. And so true gospel, the true gospel will not would not be appreciated or be admired or be liked by the unregenerate heart. They actually run from God. So if you bring God, they don't like it. That's the condition of a fallen heart. Hallelujah. So um, Jesus Christ, after he preached his first message in his hometown, guess what? They, were, they said they were going to kill him. The, one of the reasons why they were going to kill him, not because he said he was God at that time, but because... Uh, it, because he was, he said he was the Messiah. He was preaching, telling them, "This scripture is fulfilling your year, and I'm the Messiah." And they, they took him to go and kill him because they didn't want trouble. Because in those days, the Romans were very brutal. Anyone who would rise up to be like a leader of the people without Roman authority sanctioning it and said, "I'm the leader of the people," and you people, the people believe and follow him, they will come and wipe all the people, kill the whole township, or slaughter them. And so Jesus now shows up and he says that I am the Messiah. In, if, in effect, he was trying to say, I'm God in the flesh or I am the Messiah. They say, hey, we don't want for us to die. Let's get rid of this guy before he brings us problems. So that's why they took him to the brow of the hill on which the city was start built and to throw him down. But he walked from among. That's different from what I just read when he said before Abraham, I am. All right. So Jesus Christ's statement, the I am statements. His I am statements. He said, I am God. He didn't say, um, I, he said, I, I, I am. So for instance, in, in John, there are pop, seven popular or seven common and well-known I, I am statements in John. In John chapter 6, verse 35, he said, I, I am the bread that came from heaven. In John chapter um, 8, verse 12, chapter 9, verse 5, he said, I, I am the light of the world. Hallelujah. I, I am the light of the world. Uh, so that's two. And the third one, in John chapter 10, verse 7, he said, I, and verse 9, I, I am the door. In verse John chapter 10, verse 11, verse 14, I, I am the good shepherd. Hallelujah. So he said, I am the bread that came from heaven. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the shepherd, the good shepherd. And then he also continued to say in, in, in the book of John chapter 11, verse 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Hallelujah! <laughs> he said, there's no life. Anything that doesn't have me inside, they don't have life. Anybody doesn't have life. Anything without Christ doesn't have life because he is the He said, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 
chapter 11, verse 25. And then in John 14, verse 6, I like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I am a way. That's the problem. People have, that's the problem of the exclusivity of Christianity. All right. We cannot be, Jesus said, any other way is not the way. Watch this. All, all, relig all religions can be wrong, but not all religions can be right at the same time. All religions can be wrong, but not all religions can be right. We can be right and others can be right because fundamentally there's a major difference. Hallelujah. So Jesus said, I am, I am the way, not a way, the way to the Father. I am the way, the truth. Truth is not relative. Truth is a person. Jesus is truth. He said, I am the truth and I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then finally, in John chapter um, 15, verse 1 and verse 5, he said, I, I am the vine. So I am, I, I am the bread uh, from heaven or uh, the bread of life. I am uh, I, I, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the, 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 the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I, I am the vine or the true vine. Hallelujah! Jesus, his I am statements were pointing to something bigger because you couldn't say the things you said. that You couldn't say that if you were... If you were not God. And that's what he said. He was trying to. By saying those things. He was making himself equal with God. That is why they said. We have to kill this guy. Because in the Jewish tradition. In the Jewish religion. And in the Jewish tradition. At that time. If you blaspheme. Blasphemy is tantamount to death. The punishment is death. You have to be executed. So when he said. He's God. They said. That's blasphemy. So they have to kill. Him. But he couldn't say otherwise. Because he actually was God. So they killed. Why did they kill him? They killed him because he said he's God. That was the charge for his, his execution. They killed him because they say, he said he's God. But number one is the, his I am statements. And number 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 two, he claimed he, he claimed to have a unique relationship with God because he was the only one who could call God Abba, Father, Abba. You know, because Jewish children will call their father Abba, Abba. That's very intimate, personal relation. That shows that you are my true father. We are, I have your DNA. And he called God Abba. No one could call God Abba. All the prophets. In fact, no religious leader can say, I'm a child of God. <laughs> Jesus said, I, I, Abba. He used to call the Father. So in John, John chapter 17, verse 1, he said, Father, when he was praying, he said, Father, when you're touching us to pray, he said, say, Our Father. He said, I'm going to my Father and your Father. So the, our Father is a different way from his personal Father. He had a very unique relationship with God, which he claimed that because he was God. So number one, his I am sayings. Number two, he claims of unique relationship with God. Now, uh, no, number three, he chose to be born. He's the only one who chose to be born. He chose the place of his birth. He chose the place, uh, a place of his birth, the time of his birth, and who would give his parents or his mom. So Jesus was the only one who chose to be born. You could, when you read the Bible very carefully, you come across phrases like, I came into the world. I came, I came to the world. I came. He really was not saying I was born. There's only place where he said, for this, even when he said, for this reason was I born, he said, for this reason came I into the world. John chapter, um, chapter 18, verse 30, 37. John 18, 37. He said, I came. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8 is such an amazing text. John chapter 8, verse um, 42. John 8, 42 says, Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth and came from God. You see that? I proceed forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. So he was trying to say that I've already existed and I came from God. I proceed forth and came from God. Luke, John chapter 16, verse uh, 27 and 28. It says that, For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. Okay, the father himself loves you because you have loved because you have loved me. Watch this, not just that you have loved because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. See that believing. If you don't believe that he is from God, if you don't believe that Jesus is God, you you are not saved. You are not saved. So he's he believed that I came from God. Verse twenty. He said, I came forth from the Father and I am come into the world again. I. Uh, 
into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. So Jesus was clearly teaching and letting his disciples know that he came from the Father. He came from the Father. John chapter 6, verse, there's it's quite a few, uh, but because of my time, look at chapter 7, verse 28. John 7, 28 says that then Christ then cried Jesus in the in the temple as he taught saying ye both know me and ye know where I I I I am and I am not come of myself but he that sent me is true whom ye uh, uh, um, whom ye know not so he said I didn't come uh, I didn't come by myself John chapter 6 verse 50 uh, 51 John 6 51 said I am the living bread which came down from heaven. All right. So he said, I came down from heaven. I came. There are quite a few scriptures of God my time. I came down from heaven. Yeah, yeah, um, John chapter 17, verse 8. John chapter 8. I read, I read uh, verse 42 already. John chapter 16, verse 20. So there are quite a few scriptures. He said, I came. He did it because his birth is, is a unique birth. His birth was not new introduction to the world. He has already existed. So I just decided to come. All right, so that makes him a very unique person, as I said earlier on, his birth, all right? But what he said about his birth himself, he said, I came. That means that he's God. So the things he said, he said that his I am sayings, he said, um, uh, he, he, um, his I am sayings, he claimed that he called God Abba, all right? He called God Abba, his father. And then number three, he chose to be born. Okay, he claimed that he came into the world. That means he came from somewhere. And then number, quickly number four, he arranged his own death. It's almost like suicide. He knew he was going to die. He knew the time he was going to die. Do you know when he died? He died 3 p.m. Okay, at the same time that on the Passover, when the, the lambs were slaughtered, the lambs were supposed to be slaughtered at 3 p.m., the Passover lamb. And that's the same time he also died. He died at the same time when the Passover, because he is the Lamb of God, the Passover, the original Passover Lamb of God. He couldn't have died any other time. So he, sh so he showed, he chose when he was going to die, where he was going to die, and how he was going to die. He chose it. There was his death, he chose all these things. He said, "This is how I'm going to die." He said, "This is where I'm going to be." So his, his, what he said about his death points to the fact that he is God. And then number. Um, that's number four. Number five, he forgave other people's sins. Can you imagine? How can you look? You know, you and I, we can forgive people when they do something against us. But I can't forgive somebody when they do it against you. I can't forgive them and they are free. You are the only one. We are the only ones. I am the only one who can forgive people who have done something against me. Okay. So forgiveness of sin is is personal is from me but jesus was able to forgive others who have done sins against god yeah he was the only one who can forgive people their sins he could for he tell you your sins are forgiven you your sins are forgiven hallelujah he came to forgive so he that claim in mark chapter 2 verse 7 he said they said the Pharisees said who can forgive sins but god verse 5 says that he said to the man the sick man your sins are forgiven and then verse 7, they were having problems. Said, Who can forgive sins but God? Yeah, because he was God. So he could forgive sins. And then number 6, um, he he also said that he, he is going to die to set people free from the power of sin. He said, when I die, I will set, you, I will set people free from sin. How can you say that? You die will set somebody free from sin. Yeah, because he was God. And number um, that's number six. Let me just add one more. Number seven, he said, I'll resurrect. Number eight, he said, when I resurrect, he said, one day I'll judge the whole world. Can you imagine? And then number nine, he said, um, um, he, one day he'll come and rule the whole world. So one day he'll judge. And then he also said, I'll come and be the ruler of the whole world. I mean, these are serious claims. The things he said, he was pointing to the fact that he was not that ordinary person. He was a unique god in man. God captured in man. Hallelujah. Well, and then let me just try and round up now. So I've spoken mainly about the things he said. So in the living of Jesus' living, his human living, he, there are three things, three key things that point to his, his, his exceptionalism. Okay. Number one, his, um, uh, his, the things he did. Number two, who he was. Number three, what he said 
And what he said was in two ways, the things he said to people and what he said about himself. And it is what he said about himself that got him killed. They killed him because of who he said he was. But he couldn't have said otherwise. So that's who he was. So the things that point to his, his, his divinity, his deity, his birth, his human living, and as I mentioned, his death. When he died, Bible says that the rocks were broken into two. A lot of things happened. When he died, Bible says that the sun got went out. The sun in the in the afternoon, the sun went out. All right, the, and darkness came upon the earth. The temple, the curtain, or the veil in the temple. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter twenty-seven, verse fifty-one. The veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. So darkness, veil was torn. Bible says that there was an earthquake. Bible says that the rocks, rocks were split, split into two rocks, big rock. Pow! And the Bible says that dead people came back to walk on the streets of Jerusalem. And there, no, tombs were open. And then at this resurrection, the, the dead people came and walked and appeared to people physically. That is, this is a cosmic event. It wasn't an ordinary death. It wasn't an ordinary. On the cross, he was working. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. On the cross, he said, woman, it's your son. He was caring about, he was caring about people. He said, woman, this is your son. Woman, that's your son. Take your son. Or son, your mother, mother, your son. On the cross, he was caring about people. And on the cross, he said to the thief, today you shall be with me in paradise. Luke chapter, Luke chapter 23, verse uh, I think 46 or so. He said, today you shall be with me in paradise. Or 43, somewhere there. You shall be with me in paradise. Today, I tell you, you shall be with me in paradise. Then he begins to communicate with God. Then he said, I am, I test. He asked, said about, now he's began to talk about himself. I test. He said, it is finished. He said, Eli, Eli, Lamar Sabak turning, Father, Father, why have you turned your face away from me? Why have you turned away from me? Why have you forsaken me? And then the last thing he said on the cross, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So, Father, in thy hands I commit. Luke chapter, I think, 23, verse 45. I put there, I think so. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He was quoting from Psalm 31, verse 5. That is what every Jewish boy is taught by the mother. That Jewish boy's way of saying good night is, Father, is sorry, is into your hands I commit my spirit. And then they sleep. Why? Because they know they are waking up the next day. <laughs> Luke 23, 43. They know they are waking up the next day. So when they say, I commit my spirit to your hand, then they go to bed. So Jewish mothers teach their sons and their boys and their children how to pray this prayer when you go to bed. You say, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And then Jesus too, just before he died, he said the same thing. Why? It's because he knew he was going to come back. He was going to resurrect. He was going to resurrect. He was going to, the only difference between the Jewish boy's own and Jesus' own, the Jesus only said, Abba. Jewish boy, they don't call God Father. But he said, Daddy, Father, into, my, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And then he gave up the ghost and he resurrected. So the last point that proves that he is Christ. Every other thing I've said is not as weighty as the fact that he resurrected because they killed him for accusing him that he said you are God. And God raised him to prove to them that he's right. You are wrong, he's right. So the resurrection was proven, was, was proven to the people that they are rather the culprits and he's the innocent one. They crucified him saying that you are, you are guilty. You are guilty for saying you are God. God raised him to prove to them that he was right for saying you are is God and you are wrong for saying he's not God. Hallelujah! His resurrection is the people. So any, if you take away the resurrection of, from the dead, Jesus is dead, it neutralizes everything he did in, in, in his human living. All he said and did doesn't matter if he stayed in the grave. That's why Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians, Chapter 15, I think from 17, 18, 19, particularly 19. He said, verse 7, he said, If Christ did not resurrect from the dead, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. You are still in your sins. Verse 17, I think so. First Corinthians chapter 15. Please, please permit me to, to read my Corinthians. Hallelujah. I pray somebody's learning something. Huh. Do you know this Jesus? Who do you say Jesus is? 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17, he said that if Christ be not raised, you are, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. It has neutralized everything. And watch this. Then they, uh, they which are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Those who have dead in Christ have perished. Look at verse, verse um, 16. If the dead not be raised, then Christ has died in, in uh, Christ was not raised. And if Christ was not raised, your faith is in vain. You are in your sin. Your faith is not salvific. Okay. You are in your sins. Verse, uh, verse 18. Then they who have also died in Christ have perished. Verse 19, if it's this world only, we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. But, but now is Christ risen from the dead and, be, and become the first fruit of those that sleep. Hallelujah. So Christ has risen from the dead. When he resurrected, it's a statement that he's God. Bible, oh, oh, thank you, Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4. 24. Bible said they crucified in 23. It said you took with law by lawless hands and crucified, whom God raised. Because he said, For it was not possible that the grave should hold him. It was not possible that the, he, the grave could not hold him. Verse 27 says that for you will not cut it. For you will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. God will not suffer his Holy One to see corruption. Jesus could not rot. Jesus could not decompose in the grave. Why? Because he was holy. He was pure. He was the Son of God. And the Son of God, his, his physical body, his, his physical body was brought back to life. Hallelujah! Back to life to give us hope. So in his coming, becoming a man, he brought God into man. Great is the mystery of godliness. He brought God into man. And then in his death, burial, and resurrection, he took human Jesus. He took man for the first time. He took man into God. Bible says that. And he sat at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews chapter 1, verse um, I think two and three, he was, uh, he, uh, I, I, when he had paid for sins, he sat at the right hand of the, in a, a lot of other places, all right? In Ephesians chapter one, verse 20, 19 and 20, he raised him and sat him at his right hand. In Ephesians chapter two, verse six, for we are, uh, we, he, set, he raised us with him and seated us with him on the heavenly places. In Hebrews, there, there's a lot of places. He seated, Hebrews chapter, let me add this, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, who for the joy that was set before, verse 1, who for the joy that was set before him, and joy that caused his prize, they say, and he sat at the right hand. So uh, in First Peter chapter, sorry, in First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, the scriptures say that there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Jesus. So he's still man, all right? He's still man in glory. So he came. He wasn't man when he came. He was just God. He's God in existence, in eternity. He's always been the everlasting God. Because remember in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9, the name of the child will be called Mighty God. He'll be called the Counselor. He'll be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father. That's the child's name. Oh, can you imagine? Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Everlasting Father, Mighty God. I just far phrasing it guess what so when he came he was the mighty god being born fullness of god in helpless baby hallelujah in christ alone my hope is built he is my light my strength my song fullness of god in helpless babe i believe in god the father the almighty creator of heaven and earth and in his in jesus christ his only son our lord who was conceived by the virgin mary virgin birth but he was conceived by the holy ghost of the holy ghost born of the virgin mary suffered under pontius palace was crucified died and was buried he descended to the third day he rose again from the dead he ascended into heaven the only person who died and after death he went out of this world with his body hallelujah 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 the only body only person who died and after death he went into heaven he went out of this world after uh, almost two months he died and left this world after almost two months after he had died and then when he was going to he went with his body the only man Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of the living God. Jesus, the God man, our Savior who died, even though God, even though faultless, even though without sin, he died on our, be on our behalf. He died in our stead so that we can live in his stead and have his life. Hallelujah. I'm talking about, do you know Jesus? Jesus the God man. He's fully God and he's fully man. 
I pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you and you've learned something and which will be a platform, a foundation for the rest of your Christian life and you grow on it and you build on it in Jesus. Without this word I've taught, Christianity is no, no, nothing. Jesus, the Son of God, is what makes Christianity exclusive. However, it is still all inclusive. Anybody at all can also believe. doesn't matter your religious persuasion. If you can believe in Jesus as the Son of God and commit your life to Him, you will be saved because God is all inclusive. He receives everybody who will come to Jesus. If you believe in Him that He is the I am, the ego in me, the I, I am, you will not die in your sins. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for listening, and I pray it's been a blessing. I can go on and on and on and on, but I pray you've learned something. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Well, I don't want to end without giving somebody an opportunity to say, Jesus, I need you in my life, and I want you to be in my life. If that's your genuine desire, and you want to be saved, then put your faith in the Son of God, all right? There is, there is no God but Abba, the Abba, and Christ is his only Son, and he is one with the Father and the Son. The Trinity are one. Him, the Lord, and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. So, if you want to say, Pastor, I pray, I need Jesus in my life. Please pray this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. But I believe you died on the cross to save me from my sins. And you are the Son of God. And I've sinned against God. Please wash me with your blood. Forgive me with your for, forgive me for my sins. Make me a brand new person on the inside. From today, I make a commitment that I'll serve you. I'll love you with all my heart. I'll be in church and serve your interest and serve for the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, bless her. Bless him. In Jesus' name, amen. The rest of you, I pray that God will keep you. May God bless you and keep you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you. May he cause his face to shine on you and give you peace. May he deliver you from sorrow, shame, trouble, disaster in Jesus' name. I pray his healing over sicknesses. There is someone listening to me. You have not been feeling well at all. This part of your body, this part of your body is inside. It feels like something terrible is going on and you don't know what you are. You are losing appetite aggressively. I cast that sickness out of your life in the name of Jesus. Somebody's listening to me. You've suddenly been having itchy skin. You've been itching all over. Doctors don't know what it is. I pray for your healing right now in the name of Jesus. May the power of God visit you wherever you are. Any sickness that the enemy has imposed on you, I curse his power and I deliver you from the power of sickness in Jesus' name. May the Lord keep you. May I prophesy your food is blessed. Your drink is blessed. Your going out is blessed. Your coming in is blessed. Whatever your hand finds, may God God order your steps. May God make you sensitive to his directions and directives in the mighty name of Jesus. I release miracle jobs, miracle monies. I release miracle babies, miracle marriages, miracle admissions into universities and colleges and schools. I release miracle medical reports. I release miracle businesses and contracts, miracle documents, miracle housing in the name of Jesus. Anything that your that belongs to you, which the enemy has put his hand on, I reveal the dirty hand of the enemy to leave you alone. And I speak peace in your family. I speak peace in your family. Every evil finger of the devil that has been assigned against your family, I break its hold and I cast its influence and I speak peace upon your life. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much for listening. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like it, share this video, make sure it's a blessing to somebody. I love you all. Looking forward to the next session. It's going to be beautiful. God bless you. Bye. Creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, our judge and our defender, suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you Descended Descended into God You rose in glorious life Forever Forever seated high I believe I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the 
We are so thankful for you, our Caris members, and anyone else tuning in. We hope you were blessed by today's message. We want to thank you for your prayers and giving in this time. To everyone who has been faithful with their tithes and offering, we thank you for partnering with us in spreading the gospel. For those of you who wish to give, this can be done online by going to charis.org forward slash giving or via bank transfer using the account details on the screen. During this time, why not browse through our YouTube channel for more teachings and also make sure you subscribe and click on the notification icon to be notified of any new message. We look forward to fellowshipping with you again. God bless you.